you know, if I'm sure there will be entire books written by ChatGPT, but my guess is they won't be terribly successful. I think it's going to take over most of the lousy thought leadership out there. <laughs> Today's guest is Tom Davenport, acclaimed author, academic, and speaker. Tom's a distinguished professor of IT and management at Babson College, a visiting professor at Oxford, a fellow of the MIT Initiative on the Digital Economy, and a senior advisor on AI to management consultant Deloitte, among his numerous advisory roles. Tom has written or edited 20 plus books over the last few decades. His most recent works focus largely on AI, analytics, and big data. For instance, his most recent book, All In on AI, which he co-authored with Deloitte consulting principal Nitin Mittal, offers inside perspective on the mainstreaming of AI across industries and the globe. Tom's thought leadership stature soared in 2007 after co-authoring Competing on Analytics with fellow academic and former management consultant Jeannie Harris. What's the Big Idea, which Tom co-authored with knowledge management guru Lawrence Prusak, was celebrated for uncovering the best ways to harness and capitalize new ideas. And his research and writing in the early 1990s was pivotal to making sense of the phenomena that came to be known as business process reengineering. Tom has also published over 250 print or digital articles for Harvard Business Review, MIT Sloan Management Review, The Financial Times, and many other publications. That's quite a publishing track record in journals that are notoriously hard to crack. Harvard Business Review editors value his contributions so much that Tom was featured in the 10 Must Reads of 2017, the Definitive Management Ideas of the Year, and again in 2019 of an issue with the same name. One of his articles is also featured in HBR's 2019 book, 10 Must Reads on AI Analytics and the New Machine Age. What sets Tom apart as a thought leader is his research ethic. This isn't surprising given his background. Tom led research at a who's who of consulting companies, Accenture, McKinsey & Company, Ernst & Young, and CSC Index. His ability to capture fact-based insights and case example evidence in conjunction with his powerful storytelling skills have made Tom a must read for business leaders seeking practical insights and wisdom on the operational improvements that can be attained with modern information technology. But what I like most about Tom is his accessibility. When I was a journalist covering IT or as a thought leadership program leader, seeking a reality check on business technology trends, Tom usually answered my calls. And his inputs typically added meaningful context and prescriptive value on the topic at hand. In this episode, Tom and I discuss the early days of thought leadership in management consulting and what it takes to be a meaningful thought leader in the IT space today. How he surfaces and synthesizes trends into relatable and meaningful ideas that can be shared in articles, books, or presentations. His personal thought leadership wins and losses, the art of thought leadership co-authorship, and his formula for getting into top management journals like HBR. And given Tom's insights and foresights on machine intelligence, the role generative AI may play over time in thought leadership research, writing, and dissemination. Tom, thanks for joining us today. I know that's a long list of things to cover, and hopefully we'll do them all justice. Happy to be here. Thanks, Alan. So why don't we start with something pretty straightforward. How did you get started in management consulting research with a focus on IT? Uh, well, I was an academic, and I didn't really like the fact that the stuff that I wrote would be read by, I don't know, five or six people around the globe. <laughs> So I got more and more interested in consulting. I had been a um, uh, kind of a user assistant uh, um, for statistical computing in graduate school and then uh, actually became head of end user computing for Harvard's Computing Center for a little while. And so that was why I was interested in the technology. And I remember I got a Harvard Business School Guide to Management Consulting, and I, I thought it was really interesting. And I um, uh, had my eye on one company in particular, a company called Index, which you are familiar with because your colleague Bob Boudet worked there. And um, I don't know, nobody was taking me terribly seriously um, as a you know, PhD in sociology. 
in the consulting world. So I finally decided I'd better go to business school. So I um, applied to Harvard and MIT. I got rejected from Harvard Business School, even though I had a PhD from Harvard um, in four years, which is about as quick as anybody gets one. Um, uh, maybe they thought I wasn't practical enough. I don't know. And then I, but I did get into MIT. I was all ready to go. And a couple of weeks before I was supposed to start, I got a job offer from Index, which I'd done a little bit of consulting for um, some statistical computing consulting, basically. So um, I took it. And, um, but then I immediately was assigned to a project working with Mike Hammer um, and a guy named Walter Popper on end user computing. And I really liked that. And it, I realized I like research and thought leadership better than I like mainstream consulting. So that's basically what I've done either in consulting firms or business schools for now, I don't know, almost 40 years. So you did have a real solid background, at least to some degree in IT. You just didn't kind of glom onto the topic because it was so hot in those days. You actually had some hands-on experience, it sounds like. Well, yeah, and it wasn't as hot then as it is now. It was, you know, starting to get hot, I guess, in the kind of popular um, imagination. But I had a lot of exposure to one aspect of IT, you know, not so much the kind of transactional um, side, but what you do with data. And that's always been more interesting to me um, anyway. So how did you make that transition? from consulting to thought leadership. Can you talk about your, your formative experiences here? Uh, well, I remember going to, um, I, I had a meeting, I worked a lot with Mike Hammer, the late Mike Hammer, and he was certainly, you know, a good mentor. Um, I remember going to my first meeting with Harvard Business Review, I think with him, and we had a list of things that we would like to write about, one of which actually several years before um, he wrote an article in HBR, before I wrote in MIT Soul Management Review, was about this re-engineering idea. And they said, no, we're not interested in that. Um, but they were interested in an article um, about uh, kind of how management, how senior executives can get involved in, in decision-making about IT with a, an approach that we we called a principles-based approach to information architecture. So that was my first HBR article. They stuck a guy's name on it who had nothing to do with it, as consulting firms often do. But um, uh, I thought this is fun, and I, I like this, and I'm going to keep on doing it. And then um, I'd written this article on re-engineering when I left Index, the first article, by a few weeks anyway, certainly not the best known article. And um, then after a few couple of months, I was um, visiting my in-laws and I woke up and I said, I should probably write a book on this. So I did. And um, it was the first book on re-engineering, the most popular one either. <laughs> so it's interesting. The HBR rejected the whole concept of uh, business process uh, re-engineering. But obviously, it caught on pretty quickly. Can you talk a little bit about how it started to germinate and take hold and the role that thought leadership played in kind of getting out in front of the demand for this kind of service? Yeah. I, well, I mean, you know, Mike Hammer's article was called Don't Automate, Obliterate, which um, uh, and mine was called The New Industrial Engineering Colon information technology and business process redesign. So that tells you something about the marketability of our respective approaches. Uh, you know, Mike can't take credit for the title, but editors uh, do the titles, of course. But, and, and I've profited um, from that as well over time. But um, yeah, I think the timing was just fortunate. Um, we were very concerned at the time that Japanese companies were going to eat our lunch with quality and the fifth generation computing initiative and so on. And um, I there have been a lot of interest in quality management, but it's not, um, you know, Americans typically are not patient enough for long-term quality management. They, they prefer home runs to 
walks and singles and so on. So um, uh, I think re-engineering was very appealing in that regard. And you know, so often these thought leadership um, ideas are success and failure as a result of timing. And the timing was really good. But I think we were probably entering a re recession too. People were looking for ways to get out of the recession. And um, and Index uh, wasn't terribly well known, but they um, did a good job of harnessing uh, publicity. The got some good ghostwriters to write the book, <laughs> and uh, the book was, I think, you know, a good introduction to get people excited. As Tom noted, Process Innovation: Reengineering Work with Information Technology was the first book written on the worldwide phenomena that would become known as business reengineering. It came out 30 years ago, was a bestseller, and helped to form a movement alongside Reengineering the Corporation, which was written by mentor and Index Group colleague Michael Hammer and CEO James Champy. In Process Innovation, Tom postulated that strategy was no longer sufficient to drive business success. Organizations needed radically new ways of working or processes to execute their strategies. As is typical of Tom's work, he revealed real-world examples of process innovation in action. For instance, he pointed out how IBM applied the principles of process innovation to reduce the prep time for quotes to buy or lease a computer from seven days to one, while simultaneously preparing 10 times as many quotes. Tom's breakthrough research on process innovation clearly contributed to business reengineering's accelerated recession and uptake. His thinking on the topic still resonates today, wherever business meets technology. So how has thought leadership changed over the years in which you've been involved? Uh, what kind of skills, structured thinking, creative instincts are really required to be successful as a thought leader? Um, well, I think it's, I don't think that the skills have necessarily changed, except that, um, you know, being a traditional sort of uh, researcher, writer, academic is probably less valuable now than it was just because the, the um, distribution channels for management ideas have exploded. And so, um, you know, I um, haven't gotten onto TikTok yet, but I do sometimes wonder if I should have. And, uh, you know, in uh, fiction, for example, you have the Colleen Hoover phenomenon where um, most of her fame and fortune and very high positions on the New York Times bestseller list are basically attributable to TikTok. So um, and I don't think anybody's exploited that too much yet on the management idea side, but uh, probably it's only a matter of time. And so I think you have to be open to those new channels and um, you know think uh, about how you get the message out in all sorts of ways. And that was not the case. I mean, um, I remember a former editor of the Harvard Business Review um, writing in a, in a book um, uh, called The Lords of Strategy. He wrote, oh, if you write one Harvard Business Review article, you get enough consulting work to keep your firm going for a couple of years. And that's hardly true anymore. You write, write, write one Harvard Business Re Review article and then write a couple of other digital articles for Harvard Business Review and some management review and various trade press publications and 14 LinkedIn posts and uh, 36 podcasts, and maybe you'll get somebody's attention. Right, right. So you, you've talked a lot about the dissemination and the publicity for your thinking. How about the actual crafting of your, your big ideas and how you research and validate your notions and how you then bring them to life in books and other media? Well, Alan, it's not widely known, but I actually discovered um, ChatGPT 20, 30 years ago. So all of my books were written using that technology, though so, um, I didn't really have to do much. No, no. <laughs> um, we'll explore that again later. But go ahead. <laughs> I, um, I, you know, I think that at least in my case, um, you really have to get out into the world. You have to talk to a lot of people. I, you know, I try to adopt um, and, and research business ideas at a relatively early stage. I don't think of myself as inventing them, 
you know, business process re-engineering wasn't invented by me or my camera or, or, or not Jim Champy, but um, it was invented by companies who had, you know, problems to solve. And so um, I think getting close to practice is really important. At Index, I co-founded with my camera a, a research program called PRISM, Partnership for Research and Information Systems Management. And, you know, it was funded research by a bunch of companies, and we found out about what they were doing in different areas. And so it was um, great fodder for writing about them. And I've had a number of those programs since then. They're frankly a lot of work to manage, and I'm not doing it now. I just, you know, call up companies and talk to them. But, um, you know, they're, they're paying you to do research every six months or so, you'd have face-to-face -face meetings with them. You'd have to come up with something interesting to say. Fear of embarrassment is a powerful motivator. So um, it did drive a lot of thinking about, you know, um, how we package up these ideas in a way that's interesting and, and helpful to these companies. And, and I think there's still um, programs like that. Fred Reicheld has one at Bain. Um, uh, Clay Christensen had one at HBS, one of the few. When I was at HBS, I proposed um, doing more of these programs, and they kind of discouraged me. We don't need money to do research and so on. But it's not so much the money. It's just the, the contact with the uh, companies that, that really helps. Yeah. You do a lot of qualitative interviews in, in your books. And beyond just, you know, you're talking about syndicated research, and then, and then you've got kind of your, your, your shooting... Uh, fish in a barrel, so to speak, but you have to go out and find the people who are the movers and the shakers and then get them to talk to you and to be able to explore to a level of depth that can help to reinforce some of your ideas. How do you do that? It's, it can't be easy to do. Well, I mean, it's um, it's easier now than it used to be because, you know, I get a lot of emails from PR firms um, saying, oh, this startup has done something really fantastic. Um, would you write something about them? And then I always say, well, I'm, maybe I'll write about them, but it has to be in the context of what one of their customers is doing with their fantastic invention. And so, you know, that gives an opportunity to write. And I guess the uh, if there's any benefit to having written 23 books and I don't know, I think now 220 Harvard Business Review articles, most people you know, have some idea of who I am, or if they look me up, they can find that I'm not a charlatan. So they will usually talk to me. And, but it, it's a lot of work. It takes a lot of um, effort to talk to these companies and kind of synthesize what they say. And I, I, as I say, I try to get into an area early and where the concept is not so well understood that you could easily do a survey or something like that. But I, I have done a number of surveys as well. And I'm, happy to do that if if you know we want to get a broader reading on what's happening in the in the world at large but but in your latest book all in on ai um you are talking to established businesses when you're talking about the use of ai in some cases it may be considered confidential or sensitive uh, how they're applying the the various algorithms and thinking and acquiring the the human resources necessary to make it work so you have to kind of skirt a fine line, I think, between really revealing enough to, to show what your, your thinking is without disclosing anything that your, your interview subject may feel is uh, going to put them in a, in, a, you know, in a bad situation with their management that they've disclosed something that shouldn't be public domain. How do, yeah, how do you well, that fine I, I, line? Do, I do always say, I tell them that I won't um, write anything that they can't see ahead of time. And... No, it violates journalistic principles, but I'm not a journalist. Um, that approach supposedly did get me fired from a non-paying job blogging for the Wall Street Journal um, because they found out that I had asked um, someone I was um, interviewing to review what I had written about them and said, oh, that violates every every law of journalism. And eh, I said, funny, you never told me I couldn't do that. And and B, I'm not a journalist, but um, I just think, you know, nobody wants to be embarrassed in print. And so uh, I think sometimes it does mean that you have to cut out something that that um, is important or 
essential to really truly understanding what's going on in a company. But there is also the mechanism of describing companies anonymously, and I do that a fair amount too. And you know, if you're going to say something bad about a company, you probably will have to anonymize it. But you know, that's okay. I do try to mention. Um, actual companies as often as I can, though. Yeah, and that's great because I think at the end of the day, it's more credible and believable for the reader. It's it's a real world scenario, and you know, it's not just some hypothetical thing that you know. Well, we know you've done your research, and you you're, you're not going to put your name on something that that's made up. The reader sometimes just sometimes questions. You know, is this really the way it's supposed to? The way it's laid out in the book, for per se. Yeah, amazing how many things I see from consulting firms or whatever, and they don't have a single real life example. It drives me crazy. I don't know how they think they can get away with that. As a journalist covering the space, I can tell you that that was more often than not the case. Well, we're working on something. You know, we've, we've got some case illustrations we can share with you. Let me ask you this. In, in, the, in the latest book, All In on AI, um, you work with a co-author who's a partner over at Deloitte. And I'm wondering, what is it like, and you've worked co-authoring lots of books over the years, what's it like co-authoring with somebody? And how do you find that right balance between your ideas, his ideas, or her ideas? And how do you kind of consolidate them into one point of view? Um, Well, you know, every, I'd say the majority of my books I've I've co-authored, I never really counted which ones were and which ones aren't. I, you know, writing a book is a fairly lonely activity, and I generally like it better when I have somebody to talk to about the ideas. Um, um, Some co-author relationships are um, very productive. They do, you know, at least half of the work. Um, Some, they don't do much, but they supply some ideas. I don't think I've ever had a co-author that didn't at least, you know, talk to me occasionally about what I was writing. But um, it's, uh, you know, writing comes pretty easily to me. I mean, one could quibble with the quality, but the quantity is not a problem. I've never had writer's block. And so um, I, I, it's worth it to me if somebody is, you know, engaged in the topic and willing to, to read it. Sometimes I've had a lot more than that, sometimes not. So jamming can be very... Uh can unlock even better and bigger ideas by just bouncing things off of people. Yeah. And certainly, um, I mean, uh, in Deloitte, for example, I got access to some companies that I wouldn't have known about. Um, You know, it does mean you have to have everything reviewed by the risk department and the um, client service partner who's, who controls that relationship. So it's a bit of a hassle, but fortunately, some other people handled most of that um, process for me. So when we spoke last October, you were prepping for your presentation at our Profiting from Thought Leadership Conference. You were quite upfront about certain concepts that weren't as successful as you would have liked or thought they might be. You referenced the attention economy, knowledge worker productivity, and performance, how to make good decisions, things like that. If you kind of roll back the the videotape, why why didn't those things work out? Why didn't they catch on? And and what if you could do it over again? What would you have done differently or better? Why don't we go back and talk some more about the bestsellers, Alan? Uh, just kidding. <laughs> um, you know, I it's really hard for me at least, and I think it must be for other people because they uh, almost everybody has some uh, offerings that don't um, succeed as well as others. It's really hard to predict what's going to be successful. Sometimes it's a matter of timing. Um, I that book, The Attention Economy, was one of the most fun books I had worked on. Um, We tried to be very attention getting with how we wrote the book and lots of little stories. And we wasn't easy, but we persuaded Harvard um, Business Review Press to actually put some color um, into the book and so on. But it came out on September 10th, 2001. And so there's not a whole lot we could do to get the world's attention when uh, something uh, like 9-11 was going on. Um, I, some other things I don't know. I think, you know, I, I did write this book with Brooke Manville um, on, uh, it's called Judgment Calls on how uh, 
organizations make good decisions. And I think in a way, people would rather read about bad decisions than good decisions. It's kind of strange, but uh, maybe that's human nature. So I mean, maybe some of these things I could have predicted. I always thought knowledge worker uh, productivity and performance was a really important issue. Turns out not too many people wanted to read about it. But I mean, none of these were total disasters that, you know, they maybe sold 10,000 copies, which Still I good. Saying, I think you sell 5,000 copies in, in the business category. That's considered successful. Yeah. I mean, you know, I I don't regret writing any of them, I don't think, but um, certainly some were a lot more successful than, than others. So let's talk about the successes. What made them successful? What do you think? Why do you think they stood out and they resonated with the target audience? Well, you know, we talked about the re-engineering one, and uh, as I said, I think the timing was very good on that. Um, my next big bestseller was um, the knowledge management book, Working Knowledge, and um, people were, I think, very interested in how there were some new technologies that had emerged more or less around that time, Lotus Notes, et cetera, that um, promised to sort of capture and and distribute knowledge much more effectively around an organization. And uh, this, um, we were starting to realize that the value of a company um, was in much more in its intangible assets than in its tangible assets. Certainly, in in um, tech companies, way way uh, more um, in intangible assets. So um, that uh, book, <laughs> interestingly enough, that I. Um, sometimes care. I don't care all that much, but um, academics care a lot about citations. I have way, way, way more citations. So it's almost 30,000 citations to that book because academics, I think, really like the idea of knowledge management because, you know, we think knowledge is important, I guess. Um, uh, and then the next uh, big one was um, competing on analytics and Again, the timing was right. Um, data was popping up all over the place and companies had to figure out something to do with it. And so I, I think timing is probably a more critical factor in the success of books than anything else. And you know, when you start writing these things, the timing may not be right. It's just, you know, by the time the book comes out, it is, or moving quickly. I think, you know, I did not write a book on e-commerce. Um, because I knew other people had moved more quickly into that space than I did. Um, I did just write an article on generative AI and HBR, but it was like a, a week or two before ChatGPT came out, and it was sort of totally swamped um, uh, by millions of, of words on ChatGPT. And somebody was saying to me the other day, oh, let's write a book on generative AI. And, I, you know, there aren't great books on that topic now, but by the time we finish, I think there will be a lot of books and it'll be a very crowded field. We'll so wait I'm for one of the chatbots to write it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, speaking speaking of HBR, we both noted that you've written so many articles for HBR, other, other publications of its ilk. I think if HBR had an in-house columnist, you would be among them. Uh, how have you cracked that nut? You know, it's the mecca of business management journals. Well, I was I was actually a columnist for a while. I had a sort of a I don't know if it's I can't remember if it's weekly or monthly, but I did write blog posts, and that probably accounts for a hundred of my articles or so. I never really counted, but um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think it's uh, making friends or getting to know the editors in in your space um, helps a lot. And um, uh, probably, you know, um, writing high, relatively high quality drafts that they don't have to do a lot of work with. Um, I think they, it's funny, I was um, sending a print. I don't write as many print articles as I used to. I think I have 35 print articles, but um, it takes so much longer to get things in there. Um, and, and it's harder. I think the, the acceptance rate is lower. But um, uh, the editor um, immediately said, okay, 
what examples are you going to use? Um, and that's great. You know, I, I like that because I always have some examples. I want to talk about examples. So um, I think it's knowing, you know, what, what their style is. I do write a column now for MIT Slow Management Review. Unfortunately, there aren't that many places that publish things that are sort of semi-respectable from an academic standpoint and also read by practitioners. But that's one California Management Review, but hardly anybody knows about it or reads it. And um, there's this new one called Management and Business Review that's sponsored by a lot of different business schools. And I hope that catches on. And I've written a couple of pieces for it. But, you know, HBR is still at the top. It, you know, I think it's as a as a focus of interest by business people, it's probably less than it used to be since there's just so much content out there, but it's still the, probably the single best place to publish. Yeah, I was going to ask you that question. So thanks for, thanks for covering it. You told me when we last spoke that you sometimes use HBR as a test bed for ideas, things that you're considering maybe writing longer form content on like books. Can you uh, give me a sense of how that works? Well, I don't know if it works anymore, frankly. I mean, I'm going to do that. I, I am working on a book now about kind of the citizen revolution in technology, citizen data science, citizen automation, citizen, you know, low code, no code use. And um, so I, I'm i working with a co-author on it. We decided that we'd write an HBR article on it. Um, but it's, you know, sometimes you just write things in HBR and they... Nobody ever says anything about them, really. Um, so it's quite hard to know, I think, what the reaction is. But it certainly helps, I think, to get an editor, a smart editor involved early on who sort of gives you some feedback on it. And um, I don't know, maybe there's still some sense of, you know, um, how much interest is there in the article, but it's really, really hard to assess, I think, these days. So we, we've talked a lot about uh, generative AI, and so much has been written about it already. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, what role do you see such tools playing in thought leadership, you know, say, over the near to midterm? Are they going to be part of the, the research and the writing and the, the validation process for big ideas and, and how they develop and are brought to the marketplace? I think it's going to take over most of the lousy thought leadership out there. <laughs> uh, um, you know, it's not very good. It's not good at all at um, uh, describing things that haven't already been written about. It can only write about things that have already been written about. So it's only you know, as good as the data that is indexed on the data. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's, you know, predicting uh new words based on words that have already been gone together before. And so if you want to write on leadership, sure, why not? Um, because there are millions of articles about leadership already, and it probably could do a fairly good job of that. If you want to write about um, something that hasn't really been discussed before, um, probably, you know, it's a bad bet. I what My co-author on this citizen um, development book did do a sort of literature review um, or asked chat GPT to describe the literature in that space and it was really quite helpful so I think it can accelerate the the research process a little bit uh, you know at least looking at what's been published already but um, not not terribly good at coming up with new ideas certainly you know if I'm sure there will be entire books written by ChatGPT, but my guess is they won't be terribly successful. Yeah, so, you know, aug augmenting human capability, uh, maybe taking over some of the, the manual uh, labor-intensive work of doing the, 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 the desk research that uh, is necessary to, to figure out what's been written and, and where your ideas are maybe a little different. But I, I think if you're a thought leader and you're, quality thinker and writer, you're probably not going to have to worry about uh, chat GPT taking your job anytime in the near term. 
Um, yeah, well, I, I'll probably be dead before AI starts to really write high quality books. So that'll be good. I'll be glad to be out of the business by then. Yeah. Well, before you go, how do you see the profession evolving over the next few years? Thought leadership, that is. Well, I mean, you know, you guys have done some interesting research at, at Boudet Thought Leadership on um, the number of different organizations who are um, now interested in, in in pursuing thought leadership, which I thought was quite interesting. Even consulting isn't at, at the top of the list anymore at all. Um, I was reading an article, I think yesterday, about um, how Google ha has fallen behind in the um, generative AI space, even though they were doing research a long time ago. And it said um, in the race for thought leadership in that space. So I think um, thought leadership is becoming a very broadly um, understood concept that applies to almost every business. And um, I see it still, you know, blooming in, in a lot of ways. It's a, a way to get people interested in what um, your products and services are about and how um, organizations are using them in interesting, innovative ways. And that, that's, that'll be true for pretty much every company, it seems to me. As Tom noted, we've closely followed thought leadership's evolution from its early days of creating eminence for management consulting firms to its explosion across the B2B marketplace. From IT services and financial services to accounting, law, and tech hardware and software, and every sector in between. Why the fascination with thought leadership among B2B companies? Well, being perceived as an expert on a topic that is of critical interest to a B2B company's customers, i.e. being seen as a thought leader, is today an essential ingredient in business success across industries. How do we know? B2B executives that we surveyed said that thought leadership content plays a key role in helping them to determine which firms to partner with across a variety of product and service areas. For more on our study's findings, visit the Insights and Updates section of bidettlp.com. So given that and given your background, do you think thought leaders are born or can they be developed? Um, you know, I would like to think that there is a certain uh, ability to express oneself that's necessary. Um, but, you know, none of us are born with that. So I guess that part can be developed. Um, uh, I, you know, maybe you guys should start a thought leadership institute to train people in the thought leadership profession. It would be an interesting idea. Um, we you know, do have think, some training, by the way, but I won't uh, be self-promotional there. But okay. you're absolutely right. There's an opportunity to do that. Yeah. Um, you know, I think some people are more intellectually curious than others. That turns out to be a difficult thing to inculcate if somebody is not. But, you know, given a set of basic capabilities, you know, clear expression and, and good thinking and uh, intellectual curiosity, I think you could certainly make one. Um, so have at it. <laughs> so you, you talked about uh, citizen uh, developers. What's next for Tom Davenport in thought leadership and beyond? Uh, well, you know, I, I've written five books on AI. I'm thinking maybe that's enough, but um, uh, still, you know, a lot of changes in, in how um, or organizations and individuals use information and technology. Um, if generative AI really takes off um, as a business capability, you know, I, I suppose I could be persuaded to do something else in that space. Um, the whole profession of data science, I'm quite interested in, it's still new. Um, how much uh, how does it require professionals? What does it mean for a company to really commit um, wholeheartedly to data science? Um, those are interesting issues to me and I'll continue to explore them. So, you know, I, I, I wanna write at least 25 books. Maybe I'll quit after that. I'm not. Sure, I'm still not sure people read any of these books from cover to cover. I've always been tempted to, on page 173, to put a line in there saying, "If you read this, send me an email, and I'll send yeah. you 20 bucks." <laughs> It'd be nice to be able to do a brain scan to see not only what they read but what they've absorbed. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe AI will help us with that at some point. Okay. Well, I, I think that covers everything I had uh, wanted to uh, discuss with you. Anything that we haven't discussed that you want to? 
weigh in on? Uh, no, that's, I'm sure people have, feel like they've heard enough, but um, okay. great well, questions and pleasure talking to you. Thanks again, Tom. Wonderful conversation. Appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. Tom has parlayed his academic training, research acumen, love of IT, and a keen knack for storytelling into an enduring and extraordinary thought leadership platform. While he's experienced his share of big hits and misses over his three decade career, he's had more hits than misses, of course. One thing remains a constant, his devotion to deep dive research. This has allowed Tom to deeply vet his big ideas to ensure that they transcend the ordinary and the obvious. Although Tom was rejected by HBR in his first pitch, he's become quite the regular contributor to the publication over the years. He's figured out the formula, get in early, get close to the editor, understand what makes them and their audience tick, and write something unique with lots of real world case examples to ensure verisimilitude. The same approach applies to his books. And as Tom's reputation as a thought leader has grown over the years, well-connected corporate leaders and other experts have been more receptive to his qualitative interview requests. So what's next for Tom? Writing a few more books to get to 25, which will start with his next work that will examine the emerging role of citizen developers, non-techies who build software without any code or with a minimal amount of code. This is a hot topic, one in which captains of business technology are seeking guidance, since citizens developers, if properly armed and embedded in key business function areas, could unlock higher levels of innovation and cost savings for their organizations. There may be a chat GBT book in Tom's future if he gets the urge, or if some generative AI bot doesn't beat him to the punch. Thanks for checking out Everything Thought Leadership. We hope to see you here again soon. If you enjoyed this episode, we'd love it if you'd left a like and share this episode with your colleagues. Everything Thought Leadership is a video and podcast series from Boudet TLP for thought leaders and thought leadership professionals, the people who help experts get recognized as thought leaders. You can find out more about Boudet TLP at bidettlp.com.